we are at the exhibition, uh, which is called Beyond Imagination, the treasures of Imperial Japan of the period Meiji. I am very glad to introduce you, uh, Professor Nasser David Halili, our very good friend. Absolutely. Very famous collector, philanthropist, um, thanks to whom we brought this collection in Moscow. The collection is really exquisite. Uh, it consists of different parts. So these parts are metal works, enamels, kimonos, and um, uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Halili to tell us the story of the idea of having uh, these wonderful pieces of your collection, because a major period is uh, not an easy period, not uh, so well known uh, to the public all over the world, and um, this collection, I would like to say, is the best in the world. Could you tell us the story of how you decided to collect these pieces? We started collecting uh, from uh, 1970s onward. And uh, the areas that we started to collect was originally Islamic areas in the beginning. But gradually we started to uh, branch out and collect in other different areas. Uh, I'm asked these questions uh, time after time. Uh, how come I started to collect major art of Japan? And the answer is very simple. After publishing our books and giving our first exhibition, the world has realized that major art of Japan, by far, is the greatest 19th century art in the world. Mm. Uh, now, obviously, everybody is aware of Meiji art because these artists, when they started to produce these objects, mostly it was under the patronage of the emperor. In those days, in late, 18, late 19th century, there were expositions given around the world. In Paris, uh, in the United States, and artists from all over the world used to present what they have created, not made. Because what you see in this exhibition is not made by these artists, it's created by them. So in every exhibition that they have contributed and participated in, the major artist won the gold medal of the exhibition. To tell you how popular major art was in late 19th century, even Van Gogh, who saw major art in Paris in late 19th century, said, in a way, all my work is based on Japanese art. And when the population of France in late 19th century was just over 30 million, in that ex specific exhibition, the number of the visitors was over 30 million people. So there was an incredible craze when it came to the Japanese art. And Japanese art, and what you see here, in this sort of the caliber and quality, was not cheap at all. Mm -hmm. It was by far the most expensive art. I always mention uh, the purchase of a bronze at the Victorian Albert Museum, which is very similar to the Chikochi bronze that we had, which was in the exhibition in 1994 at the British Museum. At the time that they bought that bronze, they bought a Ming plate for 15 pounds. Mm -hmm. But they paid for the bronze 1,600 pounds at the time. That showed you that these objects, when it was produced and exported from Japan to the rest of the world, was not cheap at all. It was extremely, extremely expensive. Right. And the majority of modern art artists, Monet, Van Gogh, Gauguin, Bernard, they were influenced by the Japanese art. When I had the exhibition of uh, similar what we have here in the Van Gogh Museum, 
we took about 40 of his paintings and we put it side by side with our objects just to show how much influence Japanese Meiji art had in the life of Van Gogh himself. Uh, in actual fact, um, uh, he wasn't a rich man as we know. Uh, he didn't even sell a single painting during his lifetime, Van Gogh. Mm -hmm. So that's a fact, known fact. So when the two brothers, Theo and him, wanted to buy something for their mother, what did they do? They went and bought a small Meiji Japanese vase as a gift for, the, for, the, for mm -hmm. their mother's birthday, which is now on display in the Van Gogh Museum in, 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 in Holland. So the significance of this art is, is so enormous that it was overlooked. So when I saw the beauty, the, the craftsmanship, the artisanship, the design, the color, the shape, which makes art what is called art, I realized that something need, need, needs to be done here. So not only we collected, and at the time we were very fortunate because we were first in front of the queue to be able to pick up the majority of these masterpieces from all over the world. It started by buying them, preserving them, searching their history to see where they came from. And from time to time, obviously, objects were made in pairs mm -hmm. and they were separated. Mm -hmm. So we were extremely lucky to find, let's say, those two panels that you have behind you, we saw one in London, we bought it in the early 80s, and early 90s, I saw another pair in New York. So we brought them together for the first time in 100 years. So we have repatriated, not only in, in our Japanese collection, in all other eight collections that we have, this patriation is something extremely important too, because these pieces were separated from each other, so we brought them together. Uh, I always tell uh, two beautiful stories, and I think it's a time to say it here too. Uh, in 1994, uh, when I had the, the first exhibition of Japanese art at the British Museum, which was a very big exhibition, uh, I was um, standing in front of a big pair of vases, and I realized amongst the crowd that the Japanese gentleman is kneeing in front of a vase and crying. So I said to the curator, can we go and find out what the story is? So I went to him, I pat him on the back and said, young man, what are you here for and why are you crying? And he turned around and said, I knew about my grandfather and what he has created, but I have never seen in flesh, in front of my eyes, what he has created. That gives me a lot of pride and joy to see that my grandfather was responsible for creating such a magnificent object. It's, it's a nice story. Uh, in actual fact, at the end of the exhibition, at the very end of the exhibition, a friend of mine telephoned me and said, um, can you take me around because today is the last day? And I said, absolutely. So come, we'll go together. We walked in and I didn't realize that the crowd were pouring in. When I got to the room, I couldn't get in. It was the last day and everybody who heard about it wanted to see the exhibition. So he turned around to me and said, show me your favorite piece. So I found a pair of panels similar to what you have here. And I waited till I got to stand in front of the cabinet to explain to my friend the history of it. As I was explaining the history, I noticed that somebody is tagging my jacket behind me. I looked back, didn't see anybody. Continued my explanation. A few, minutes, a few seconds later, I noticed somebody is pulling my jacket. And being a human being, I realized and I said to myself, maybe somebody recognized me who I am and wants to say thank you. So I looked back again and I saw a five-year-old girl behind me. So she looked up like that and said, I said to her, young lady, why are you taking my jacket? She said, can you please move because I want to see, read the label. So I turned around to my friend and said, now you know why I collect Japanese art. Now you know why I became a collector. Because by collecting, you bring a lot of joy, a lot of pleasure to the life of people indirectly.
Because at the end of the day, when you talk about anything in life, you talk about religion, you talk about politics, they have their own languages. But the language of art is universal. That universality is what we need today because we are living in a very complex world and the universality of art and the language of art is essential. Thank you very much. I also would like to ask you, was there anybody who helped you at the very beginning to choose the objects for your collection? You see, this is one of the greatest problems in the collecting world. Yes. If you are not yourself a person who does his work, studies, makes make himself knowledgeable about the areas that he wants to collect, it becomes problematic. Collecting, the word collector is a very, very responsible word to use. Unfortunately, it is being used very loosely. Anybody who collects a few things calls himself a collector. But if you want to be a real collector, you have to collect, you have to preserve, you have to research, you have to publish, and you have to exhibit. You have to fulfill five criteria. Because collecting for humanity is totally different than collecting for yourself. Right. If you decide to buy something for yourself for your own pleasure, get the advisor, look at something you like, buy it and take it home. But that is, I call that unfortunately, maybe some people get offended, but that is a selfish way of doing things because you imprison the object that should be shared by other people. You are not sharing your passion with anybody else. So it's you, your family, and your friends. And unfortunately, nowadays, it's even worse than that because people go and buy a painting for $100 million, whatever it is, and putting it into a dining room and invite their friends because they cannot show $100 million in a form, in any other form than saying that I have arrived, now I have money. Mm -hmm. So the significance of, of being collector and the word collector has changed dramatically from the age that I started to collect. Because in every eight areas that I collected, that we have published, I think by the time we finished 100 uh, uh, books on our eight collections, and we have given close to 150 exhibitions around the world. Uh, by then, every single piece would be, would be, would be uh, 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 researched, photographed, and published in, in, into probably 100 uh, volumes. But I, I realized that the only way to go forward, the only way to be able to collect in those areas is to have a personal knowledge in those areas. Because then you don't rely on other people. You rely on other people when it comes down to sitting down and writing the books. Because no, no, no ship can go from A to B without the sailors too. You could be the best captain in the world, but without the sailors, you cannot get to your destination. So a cooperation amongst academics and scholars, and I studied in every area myself, and made sure that I have enough knowledge of the area and the background of the object that I was buying. So that made life much easier for me. From time to time, I had to ask a few of the academics their opinion, which was valuable to me. But if you rely on other people too much, it becomes very difficult. Uh, if you have a committee to help you to collect, it becomes difficult. I always uh, use a, a very famous uh, saying of uh, Churchill. Uh, he was asked, uh, what is your opinion of a uh, committee? And he turned around and said, uh, committee is like a dark alleyway where bright ideas are brought in and ruthlessly massacred. Mm -hmm. Because in a minute you have too many people Deciding about things that you want to do, you go wrong. But if you have one mind, one aim, one direction, and you have passion to follow it, then you could create things that could be somehow valuable, could be somehow becoming part of your legacy. And at the end of the day, this question of ownership is a myth. Mm -hmm. In reality, Nothing belongs to anybody. Every one of us is a temporary custodian. Today is my call, tomorrow is somebody else's. And after 120 years, when none of us are here, 
these objects would speak for us. So the legacy continues through the soul of the artists who have created these objects. So my way of collecting has always been different. And unfortunately, nowadays, art is becoming a commodity. In my days, it was not a commodity. In my days, we were doing it for the love of it, for the passion of it. Value didn't come into it at all. Because we didn't think that we buy something for X and one day it's worth Y. Because that was irrelevant to me. Because it wasn't mine. It belonged to humanity. It was created by these artists. And their soul was following it every inch of the way, you see. So I look at that collecting differently. And um, when you look back, you had uh, Gulbankian, you had uh, Getty, you had uh, Rockefeller, you had uh, Chester Beatties. These were the iconic collectors of the day. And their view to culture and art was a view to help humanity, to enhance humanity. It was not a selfish collecting. I know you as a very passionate collector um, with a wonderful taste and a lot of knowledge. And your collection is really exquisite. Could you tell me anything about your favorite objects of this collection? And probably you will show us and tell some stories about these pieces. I gladly would show you some of the objects that uh, I like. But when it comes to favorism, um, I regard every object in the collection like my own family and my own kids. And I always tell my friends, and I'm asked that question many times, I ask them, are you married? And they say, yes. And I ask them, how many children do, they, do you have? And they say, five. And I would turn around to them and tell them, OK, which one is your favorite? It's very difficult, because when you have collected so many objects, your taste sometime during the period of the collecting changes too. So something that appealed to you too much at the time that you purchased it, six months or a year later, when you buy another object, the, 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 the passion doesn't diminish, but switches itself to another object that you buy. And you don't consider anything or take the favorism out of your collecting your view toward art changes too. Because art is really universal. And art is really timeless. And if you look at art as something timeless, you won't ask that sort of a question. Right. Uh, Thank you very much. Pleasure.